Divine Truth Events These are events and presentations by Jesus and Mary. This presentation is part of the Relationship with God series. The topic is Understanding Your Emotional Self. Presented by Jesus on the 25th of May 2014 in Kentucky, New South Wales, Australia. This is Session 4, Part 1. All right. Well, welcome to session four of Relationship with God, Understanding Your Emotional Self. Remember I said that the first part of this day would be doing a little bit of revision and some a little bit of extra things that we missed out on yesterday. And then I'd like to open it up to have answers with your que que questions and answers so that I can answer some of your questions about the subject. But I just would like, before I start, to address some of the feelings yesterday. Um, one of the things we're noticing is that more and more groups that we've seen regularly um, are becoming overloaded more and more with information that they're not processing. And that was very evident yesterday. So the first half of yesterday was very heavy going for me. And the main reason why was because I could just feel this feeling of resistance in the group generally. Now, not all of you are in resistance. There are some of you who are not. Um, but there are two levels of resistance in the persons who are resistive. One is fear is driving your resistance. So, so many, many of you hear more information and feel overwhelmed and you don't let yourself feel overwhelmed and just have a big cry about being overwhelmed or, you know, or just have a cry about not doing, what, you know, not doing it right in the past or whatever it is that causes you to feel overwhelmed. And so what you finish up doing is you sort of just put a wall up. Now, when you put a wall up, um, it's pointless for me to talk because nothing's going in. It's like, it's like closing the lid of the bottle of your soul, you know, and as soon as that wall is there, anything I say is not going to be able to be processed by you. And so I'd be better off spending a bit of time with Mary home and playing the guitar, you know, like that's how it is. The second level, so that was the first level of resistance, which is about fear. The second layer of resistance is about denial. Many of you who were here, who were here yesterday are still in a lot of denial about, about what's really going on inside of your soul. You like to believe that everything is working fine when the reality is your law of attraction, the law of attraction is illustrating to you already in your personal life that everything isn't going fine. And uh, you're not being honest about that. And you're also not being honest about the fact that you believe that everything's good when everything in your life really isn't very good, you know. And, and if you're honest about that, then you would probably get out of your denial and probably start to feel some of your fear. And that would be wonderful. But while there's fear or denial driving uh, your attendance to any group, my feelings are, well, that group of people I can't speak to at the moment. N not for any other reason than anything I say is like hitting a brick wall and bouncing straight back off of it. That makes sense? And there's a whole heap of truths that we need to present, or that I'd like to present, which are what I would call truths that will help a person grow beyond... So if, most of what I've been presenting at this point, so if I rewind a bit, most of what I've been presenting at this point has been things to help you get out of the first sphere of the spirit world and of earth and, and into loving truth and loving confronting your fear and loving feeling some of your emotions and, and loving to you know, express yourself more clearly and express your desires in the world that you live in and, and all of those things. And they are all the things that you need to do to get out of the first sphere, get out of the hells of the spirit world. That's are the things you need to do. And most of the information we've been presenting up until now has been information revolving around helping people get out of that condition. In other words, helping you raise your condition above the rest of the world into, into a point where you can now start feeling God and feeling the progress you're making and growing your own soul in a really proactive way. That's the kind of information that we've been sharing up till now. But then, of course, there's all the information that needs to be shared about the kinds of things you're going to learn through the second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh spheres, right? And those, all of those things 
they're all emotional in nature, so without understanding your emotional self, um, none of those things can be really learnt or, or absorbed into your soul. And then the, also they are all mostly joyous in the sense that you, you start to feel the joy of being, you know, of knowing these truths. At the moment, most of you don't feel joy knowing truth, particularly truth about yourself. You hate it, actually, many of you. Hate it. You hate it so much that you, the instant somebody starts talking to you about your personal issues, you have instantly got the wall up, whether it's a wall of denial or a wall of fear. Either way, it prevents any absorption of any information. Right? And strictly speaking, if I honoured your will, I would not talk to you. Because your will in that moment is being expressed to deny or to be afraid of new truth. And so anybody who's in a condition where they love you would go, OK. And to be honest, if you were in a spirit world in this state, the spirits who would be helping you, they'd say, OK, you can stay in this place that you want to be in, obviously, for as long as you wish. Um, I'll go away and wait for when you want to change that. And like, as I said earlier in a private discussion, Sometimes that might be 100 years later you start realising that your life hasn't changed and you want somebody to come back and help you understand why. And if it takes 100 years, it takes 100 years. Like, from God's perspective, 100 years, 1,000 years, whatever. <laughs> God created you to be an infinite soul with the potential for living forever and in infinite growth. So what's 100 years in the scheme of things from God's perspective? It's only you that you finish up hurting by having this resistance. Does that make sense? But the people who wish to help you wish to help you only when you desire that help. So that it requires a true desire for assistance and growth before you can really grow. And this is one of the things I would like to discuss with you this morning. The... the and it's a part of your emotional self. So, that, so if I just write up the top again, we're, so we're talking about understanding your emotional self. Right? And part of understanding your emotional self is understanding the use of your desire what it means to develop a desire and what it means to feel a desire. So probably what we need to do first is remind you about a few things when we raise this issue of desire. What we'd like to do is remind you about three primary things, the three primary things that I'm always speaking to you about, but we'd like to remind you about them from an emotional perspective, what they look like from an emotional perspective. All right? Now, those three basic things are humility, truth, and love. And the question I'm now going to be raising with you, or the reminders that I want to give to you first, is what does humility, humility look like from an emotional perspective? And what does truth look like from an emotional perspective, if you had a desire for truth? And what would, if you have a desire for love, what would that look like from an emotional perspective? That's what we need to do here. So what we'll do is just have a, a little discussion where Mary will raise issues um, with, with me, and, uh, and, we will, and we will talk about some of these issues together um, so that you can be reminded of what those basic things would look like if, if you're emotional. And then what I'd like to do is then raise with you the issue of developing desire, like developing a desire to be humble, developing a desire for truth, to both receive it and be in a place where you live it. And also the desire to love, what it means to love God, receive love from God, love other people, receive love from other people. So are the main things that we would like to talk about, just briefly, because we've got a lot more to share about all those things, but it's important that we discuss those particular things from the aspect of understanding how your soul works, how it can grow. See, while your soul is not open to growth, it's impossible for new information to enter it. So many of you may not, have, may not have seen our discussions that we've placed on the internet and also on our hard disk drive synchronisation service, which are all about the human soul and how it functions. I don't know if many of you have actually watched those videos, but my suggestion is to watch them because they, they give you 
a, a lot of information about how God created the human soul to function. Right? And it's very important for you to understand how the human soul functions because there are certain things about the human soul that many of you are trying to overcome that you cannot overcome in the methods, with the methods you're using. So to give you an example, there is a principle in the human soul of suppression. In other words, this principle illustrates that if you suppress one emotion, that you will not be able to avoid suppressing other emotions. So in other words, if you have an attitude where you want to suppress one emotion, all other emotions will also get partially or fully suppressed in the process. You can't avoid it. If you try to shut down the flow of emotion in your soul, even if it's just in one thing, then the flow of emotion will shut down with many other things as well. That's the way God created your soul. So whenever you choose to suppress, you're actually choosing not only to suppress the emotion you're currently trying to suppress, but you're also choosing to suppress any joy, any happiness, any, any other emotions that are positive or any other emotions that are not as, you're not as afraid of will all also get suppressed right? just through that choice of suppressing one emotion. Now, that's a principle of suppression. Now, many of you did that yesterday. You were suppressing one emotion, which is an emotion of, am I really growing? How am I exhausted? Am I, you know, that kind of emotion. And in the process of suppressing that emotion, you suppress many other emotions. And that basically meant that another aspect of the soul came into play. And this is, is this the aspect. There's an aspect of your soul that I've called preclusion. And that aspect of the soul is, if there is something inside of you emotionally that's out of harmony with truth and love, in other words, it's error that exists in your soul that's out of harmony with truth and love, and it's in there emotionally, and, you, and you're, the truth that's trying to be presented is the opposite to it, while that thing exists within the soul that's error, and while it stays within your soul, it will preclude the new thing from entering. It doesn't matter how much you sit down and swat about it. It doesn't matter how much you hear about it. It doesn't matter how many of AJ's presentations you'll hear about it. It doesn't matter how much you study about it. It doesn't matter how much you do anything about it at all. It will not change until you're willing to release the error that precludes the new truth from entering you. Does that make sense? Until you're willing to release the error, then, then basically... There is no hope of this new truth entering you. So that's an, that's an aspect that I've termed preclusion. Now, these are the, this is how God designed your soul. God designed it purposefully like that. Right? It's great when it's the other way around. Once truth has entered your soul as an emotion, uh, error can't penetrate your soul anymore because the truth precludes it from entering you. But when error is in your soul... The aspect of preclusion requires that you need to release the error before the truth can enter. And many of us are not doing that. What many of us are trying to do is we're trying to overcome the error rather than feel it and release it using our feelings. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to overcome our errors by ignoring them or denying they even exist. And you can't do that. The soul doesn't work that way. Right? So every time we try to do that, we're going to run into trouble. Right? And that's why I suggest you have a look at It's on the Frequently Asked Questions channel of the YouTube if you, if, if you haven't got them on a disc. Um, what am I getting? A bit of buzzing. Can you hear buzz? Yeah. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, what I'm, what I'm going to suggest to you is that you look at the Frequently Asked Questions channel, particularly about how the human soul functions, and, and then ask yourself, if you understood this information, really understood it, would you be so resistive to, to you know, hearing new truth? And one thing that concerns me is many of you are enrolled to come to our assistance group. That's eight days straight of presentations. Eight days. Many of you struggle hearing two days in three months. So how are you going to cope with eight days in a row? There's only one way you're going to cope, and that is every day you're going to have to release some emotion. It's the only way you're going to cope. 
And unless you come prepared to release some emotion every day and to get out of your denial and to get into some of the feelings that you actually feel, it's going to be impossible for you to actually stand being there. <laughs> and it's going to be also a waste of your money and time. Right? So I would suggest that you allow yourself to ponder about those particular things. Now let's go through what, from an emotional perspective, what it looks like when you're humble. Shall we do that? What do you think it looks like? So if I'm humble from an emotional perspective, what would I do? Hello, is it? I'd feel what I feel every moment, like that guy you were telling us about yesterday. So I'd choose to feel what I feel every yeah, moment, wouldn't absolutely. I? I wouldn't be avoiding it. No. So how many... So can you, you'd want to do it, wouldn't you? Yeah. Yeah, if you because were really... You'd, you'd have this. I reckon you'd, you'd have... <laughs> Sorry, I'm forgetting my internal voice hammering me. Yeah, forget the internal voice yeah. and just say um, what you're feeling. I just think that you'd just have this joy of just being like, yes, like here's another thing about me that I've just discovered and yes, it feels bad, but I can release this and know something new about me that's going to like... Yeah. So you, me be this cool person. So even if it's a hard emotion, you'd still feel happy that you're finding it, wouldn't you? Totally. Yeah, and maybe we need to just turn up your... Mike, which is number three. It was pretty quiet yesterday. Yeah, that's so, pretty good. Yep. Okay, so that's what you'd do. So, so you would not only choose, but you would actually love feeling your emotions. Yeah. You'd love doing it, wouldn't you? Yeah. You, would, you wouldn't go, oh, I've got to avoid that to avoid this one today. You, you'd be instead going, what can I feel yeah. today? You know, and like, what else so. can you tell me? Like, What else could... To everybody, I reckon, you know? It'd be like... What else am I seeing? Yeah. Feeling and experiencing my emotions. Yeah. So that's... What else do you think? If I was humble. If, if, from an emotional perspective. Do we need some help? Yeah, fire away, Eloise. Um, like truth, I'd be just like really, really honest both with myself, with others, with um, everyone, just about where I'm at what's going on, what I see, what I feel. You would, but sense. maybe that fits more under the quality of truth. So oh, yeah. we'll, we'll okay. talk about truth when it... We'll talk about humility, love and truth separately here. Yep, Matt? Um, I don't think you, like, hinder your emotional expression in front of other people, like, no matter where you are. Good. You wouldn't restrict your emotional expression purposefully because many, many of you are doing that, right? You're restricting your emotional expression. Why? Because other people will judge you, other people would... Now, if you were humble, you wouldn't worry about other people's judgment, right? Would you? You'd just go, OK, if other people judge me, I'd have a cry about that as well. <laughs> if you, you, you wouldn't be trying to restrict your emotional expression. So, so there'd be no restriction of expression... Um, maybe, maybe I need to say one little qualifier of that, and that is, unless love dictated otherwise. In other words, if, um, for example, if you were, uh, for example, sitting around with a group of people and you're all having a meal, and then something was said in the meal and you just started crying. Now, if you stay there and start crying, then nobody else in eating that meal can have a conversation. <laughs> right? So love would dictate that you would leave the conversation. Does that make sense? And cry somewhere where they could all still have their life. And then you would come back when you're done. That's what you would do. That's what love would dictate. You still wouldn't restrict your emotional expression. You would still go ahead and have it. But love would dictate that you would probably leave the situation so that other people can also have their life while you're feeling what you're feeling. Everyone get that? So, so there are times when you'd consider, and you're all the times you would consider what love would do, but, but you wouldn't restrict yourself and stay there. You would, you would leave. And it doesn't matter what you miss out on. <laughs> Many of you are so worried about what you're going to miss out on if you leave. You stay there and impose your will upon others, right? That's not loving. Or you impose your will upon yourself to not feel. That's not loving either. 
the best thing to do is just to leave, feel the feeling you've got, come back, and if it happens to be three hours later and nobody's there anymore, well, that's just the way it goes. Right? And that's how you would be if you were humble all the time. Yeah? Any other ideas? Yeah. Peter? Um, I think it's under this one. You'd feel open to God and, and feeling God, like, and be open to... Um, how do I want to put it? Um, you definitely feel God's love in that space as well. And you'd, you'd, you'd be connected to God in that space. You would, but, but when you're progressing, you don't always feel God's love because there might be other impediments to you feeling God's love. So um, you'd be even humble to that, wouldn't you? You'd say, I'm not feeling God's love because of I can feel the impediment. So let's talk about the types of things you'd be humble to. Like, what would you be humble to, Vanessa? Would you be more um, humble to your surroundings? So you'd, you'd be more aware of your surroundings? You'd be um, feeling when you're, you're doing something unloving to the earth, for instance? Or? Of course you would, but let's focus on internal rather than external because emotions are all about you, your internal life, your internal world. Mm. So let's focus on that. You're right, you would be able to absorb what's going on around you. you in fact, the more humble you become, the more you notice about what's actually happening in the world around you. The more you notice about individuals' feelings, the more you notice about you know, the world itself and the feelings it projects at the environment, you, you notice everything, in fact, the more humble you become. But that's a result of you first doing some things inside of yourself. So let's focus first on the things that are inside of yourself. What's happening there, Paul? Um, a sort of joy of being yourself or being authentic within yourself. Okay. And a peace that comes with that. So, let, so, so we, should we say you would be your authentic self? So, so the converse of that is what would happen to your facade? <laughs> is your facade your authentic self? No. no. So what would you do with it? <laughs> well, you can't necessarily kick it out without feeling your way through what, why it's there, can you? So what would you do? So, Matt, if we go to... I think you'd just be willing to expose it, to have it exposed in front of other people and to yourself. Okay, so you'd be willing to see it. Yeah. So, yes. so you would no longer be desiring to deny it, would you? You'd be wanting no. to see it instead, right? Yeah. So, so we'd be focused on making sure that if we were an authentic self, we'd be wanting to expose our facade, mm. see it for what it really is, rather than deny that we even have one when we have a big one. You know, that, that's not going to help us progress. And it's also not being humble. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else you can think of with your facade? What was your name again? Okay. okay. Just being more open for truth. Yes, okay. you would, but we'll talk about truth as a next layer. Well, I'm talking more about feeling and, and what being humble means uh, here, here in this section, yeah? Anything else you can think of? Yep. Well, you'd love to be your authentic self, wouldn't you? You'd, it'd be something that you always want to be. Yeah. It'd be this desire to just <laughs> always be yourself no matter what. So you'd, you'd be desiring, wouldn't you, to expose the reasons why you're not your authentic self. So what are the reasons why you're not your authentic self? What group of emotions would they be called? Fear, isn't it? Fear. So, so, so you would desire to expose and feel your fear, wouldn't you? Because you know that fear is the main reason why you're not your eccentric self, your, your, your authentic self. You know that fear is the major reason why you choose to put on a facade, right? So you would, you would desire to expose and feel the fear rather than what, what do many of us do now? We desire to avoid and suppress and hide it and make out we don't have it, right? even to ourselves let alone other people, right? But if we're humble, we wouldn't do that. From an emotional perspective, we just would not do that. Anything else you can think of? Matt? You'd reject saying an addiction. 
Okay, yes, because we know that there's a linkage between fear and the addiction in the facade, don't we? So we know that um, we know that every time we don't want to feel a fear, an addiction is automatically created, and that helps us remain in facade about the fear existing. Right? So we know that addictions are very important to actually deal with. So what do we want to do with our addictions? Feel them. Not only just feel them. How do you, how do you how do you become aware that you have them? You need to st- yes, stop feeding them, Ken. But wait for the mic, um, Eloisa. A desire to know what they are and be like um, pretty like okay. self reflective about what's really going on. So it begins with a desire to know them, mm. right? So with our addictions, if we were humble. We would desire to know them. We would, as somebody has already pointed out, feel them. And as Ken pointed out, confront them. (laughs) And we'd want to do that. And if you think about what most of us do, we don't want to do that. What we do is we want to do exactly the opposite. We want our addictions fed, right? And we don't want to know what they're doing, the damage they do to ourselves and other people. We don't want to know, and we definitely don't want to confront them because when we confront them, we feel totally unloved because our whole definition of love is all about addictions. We we see our addictions as that's the only time someone loves me. And that's the only time I love someone is when I'm feeding their addiction so that they feed mine. All of my codependency on other people and my emotions and, my, and other people on my emotions, so all my codependency of my emotions on other people and all their codependency of their emotions on mine all, all get fed in this process and we both walk away happy. Now, when we start confronting our addictions, are both people going to walk away happy from any interaction? No. In fact, it's highly likely that both people, or at least one, is going to walk away unhappy from the, from the interaction. Right? And most of us don't want that. If we're honest with ourselves, we just don't want that. All right? So what we do instead is we don't confront them. We just let them run our life because it's the only time we feel loved and we're not willing to even confront our definition of love while we do this. Okay, anything else you can think of, Matt? I think, like, in that we'd be, like, willing to actually see that we are being unloving, like, the, the yucky, the not so, like, really honestly see that. Yeah, we will. We would desire to know them. We'll feel, uh, when you feel them, you will actually start feeling the sleaze yeah, of the your addictions. And that's the only word I can use, really. It's not a sexual sleaze, although your sexual addictions will have a sexual sleaze about them. But it is a general sleaze. It's like uh, most addictions are like leech. They're like leeches, sucking the blood out of, and life out of other people and you then also feeling sucked <laughs> the blood out of you with other people. That's how the addictions work. And the reality is we would want to confront all of that and feel that. We would start feeling it and go, well, oh, that feels really off now. Once you're sensitive to them, you start feeling like, oh, no, I don't want to do that ever again. That just felt horrible. And that's how you start to be sensitive to the fact of what they're covering, the fear that they cover. All right? Yeah. Now, um, yesterday we raised this issue of the hurt child, the hurt child's emotions. What would you do with those emotions? If you were humble, Eloise. <clears throat> I'd feel them and I'd love feeling them and I'd go back and just be praying for as many memories as I possibly can have and actually feel those memories. Okay, so you'd be willing to visit the memories of your life and particularly your childhood memories. You'd have a strong desire to know what they are and feel them. And I'd want to know who, who she is. You know, who like, you're... Who I am. Who the person who was suppressed really would have turned out to be. Yeah. Yeah, it would be fantastic, wouldn't it? You'd want to know. What do most of us do instead of that? (laughs) 
What do you do? Uh, what I do <laughs> <laughs> is I go, nah, you stay out of the way, thanks. I don't even want to know about you. In fact, I don't even do that. I'm just like, nah, she doesn't even exist. Yeah, you keep her in a box. Totally. And you put the lid on her, put a few nails in the coffin and hope that it stays a coffin. Yeah. All right? That's not the way to love yourself. No. That, that child is hurt. That child needs your support, needs your love, tender care, needs your compassion, needs your honesty, needs so many things from you. Every time you put her or him in a box and then you nail it flat and then you bury it, right, you're doing exactly what your parents did with you. That's how you turned out to be the person you are right now. Your parents buried the real you by suppressing you, controlling you, resisting any of your development, telling you that you had to be what they wanted you to be and so forth. And by the time that was all finished, the real you got buried somewhere and now you're going to have to somehow unearth her or him and allow him or her to feel their emotions about that. That's, that's what you would choose to do instead. Now, some of those emotions are going to be embarrassing because they're like three-year-old. And remember yesterday we said every emotion you feel when you're relating to a childhood experience is locked up at the age of the experience. You're going to feel embarrassed feeling three-year-old when you're 35 or 40 or 50 or 60 or 70, particularly if other people see it, <laughs> right? You think, oh, that little child, where do they come from? <laughs> right? But you need to get over that. If you were truly humble, you would allow the embarrassment and still feel it. Right? So shall, shall we say we would be feeling the hurt inner child? And I don't like to say, let's call, it, call them just the hurt child. Because it's not inner, it's you. It's, you. Right? It's, the real, it's a large part of the real you. Like inside of finding that person, you're also going to find a lot of very nice things about yourself that you never knew because all of those things got suppressed as well. And if, unless you're willing to let that person, he or she, have her way with you, you're not going to be able to even come to know who you are. Right? Your parents chose to suppress that person, control that person, put that person in a box and bury it and you need to choose to do the opposite. If you're going to be humble, you would choose to do the opposite to that. Right. Okay. Now, we've covered a lot about what you would do in terms of feeling, but we haven't covered much about what you would do about some of your feelings where you have harmed others. What would you do with them? Kenny, wait for the mic. If you're prepared to be open and re um, re repentant, repentant. Yeah, exactly. You would. So you desire to know what you've done to harm others, and you'd be want to feel about that. Does that make sense? So you desire to know the harm you've caused that's what you would desire to do Teresa and and to know how to f how to fix it if you can well no see you might not know how to fix it but you would certainly have a desire Sorry, to fix it wouldn't you yeah the desire to correct to find out how you can fix it you'd want to do something about fixing it wouldn't you and, and you, would, you wouldn't be worried about making a mistake doing that. Can you see that? Many of you are so worried about making mistakes. You do something wrong, you're worried about, oh, well, I made a mistake then. And then when someone tells you you made a mistake, you go, oh, I don't know if I want to fix it because I might make another mistake. If you were truly humble, you wouldn't worry about that. You'd want to fix it. And, you'd, and if you made a mistake trying to fix it, you'd, you'd try again and try again and try again and try again until you fixed it. So you found the one that worked, <laughs> you know what I mean? That's what you would do. You'd desire to overcome uh, these mistakes and you'd see these mistakes as a growing process, wouldn't you? Yeah. If we go back to Catherine and then to Mary. And also I was thinking, um, go to a, and apologise and tell the person that you harm, that you have harmed them. Yes, 
Because a lot of times they're already trying to convince themselves that you didn't or they're feeling you did but nobody validates their emotion and so they don't get to feel the sorrow they feel about the harm, right? Yeah, so let them know. Yeah, Mary doesn't need it, Catherine. No. Yeah. Thanks, Catherine. And Mary? Um, I suppose the big issue with repentance uh, is desiring to feel the harm that I have caused the other person, not just know what it is, but yes. having a willingness to feel. To feel it. Not only the willingness to feel the harm, but the willingness to feel the reason why you chose to harm and feel the actual reason inside of you that caused you to think that choosing this harm was okay. <laughs> You'd want to do all of that too, if you were humble. You'd want to uh, go into those feelings. Now that's already quite a lot on the list of, if you were being humble, what, what it would look like emotionally. Michael? If you were truly humble, you'd have no room for arrogance. You, that is correct. You wouldn't. In other words, you wouldn't be as resistive to your own denials. You would be observant with your law of attraction in the sense of the sense that whatever your soul attracts to you, you'd be observant about what it is really going on. So, so if your wife's unhappy with you, for example, you'd be like, okay, how much have I actually contributed to my wife being unhappy to me? Not just, oh, she's very unhappy all the time, she's a bit bitchy, I think I'll just spend half the day, well, most of the day away from her, right, that kind of thing. <laughs> you wouldn't do that. You, you would want to look at your own involvement in every issue, whatever those issues were. Does that make sense? And so that, that's what we would do. We'd choose to do that because we love, we want to do that. We want to resolve every problem. When we're truly humble, we want to resolve every problem. We don't try to sweep it under carpet and make it go away. Right? We want to resolve. We're happy to be engaged in the process of resolving every issue. In fact, we see that as the only solution to every issue. We don't see denial as a solution. We don't see suppression as a solution. We don't see resistance as a solution. We don't see shoving it under carpet and making it go away as a solution. We don't see any of those things even as solutions anymore. We, we engage the process of resolution when we're humble. Well, I feel we've covered a lot there. Yeah? So you get a bit of a picture of what being, hum being humble looks like from an emotional perspective. Yeah. Now, Mary and I um, did a lot of interviews about humility, for a, f a series of five of them, sometime in 2011 or 12, I can't remember which year it was, and, and it mentions many of those things, of what it looks like, from an emotional perspective. Okay. Let's look at the issue, the next layer. Remember, humility opens you up to truth. It lets you absorb new truth. So, so, let's, so if, if I... If I am truthful, what would that look like emotionally? Hello, is it? The one I said before, but it's you're going to be truthful in every situation. You're going to like love receiving truth. You're going to love giving truth. Like you just won't even think outside of truth, really. And if you don't know what the truth is, and you realise that you're in error, you'll find that out too. Yeah. So could we say you would love truth? Yes. So how many of you love truth, really, honestly? Like how many of you are more afraid of truth? Like depends most... what it is. More, more, most people are more afraid of truth than loving truth. When you're afraid of something, you can't love it, right? Yeah. So, so, so it's either one or the other. Now, now truth, what, what's the opposite to truth? What, what's the thing that opposes truth? Fear. Okay, so straight away you can see that you'd be willing. Now, how can truth enter you emotionally? Remember I just mentioned before the human soul functioning with the, attitude, uh, the aspect of preclusion. So how does truth enter you emotionally? So if we come to Teresa. By releasing the fear on that, or the error on that subject. Right, so there's a false belief inside of your soul that's emotional on that same subject 
And for the moment, truth can't enter you on that subject because that false belief exists. So what are you going to have to, if you're truly humble, with, if you're truly feeling with regard to truth, what would you be willing to do? To release the error. Release the fear. So you'd be willing to release the fear. Now, to release the fear, what do you do? You first have to acknowledge it exists, surely, don't you? You have to become aware of its existence. You have to know that it exists. You have to then allow yourself to start to, to see how it exists. And, then, and, and eventually you'll get to the point where you let yourself feel it. When you feel it and it, you truly feel it, it will go. And when it goes, now you're open to the truth entering you. Until that point, the truth can't enter you. You, you can think yourself that it has and it hasn't. And guarantee that you put yourself in a situation where that truth is confronted, you will revert back to the error. Because you will revert back to whatever the soul, whatever is inside of the soul, every single time. So unless the truth is inside your soul, you can't revert back to it. You're only going to revert back to the error, and you know that. And so a person who's understanding their emotional self would have to have a desire, and I would, I would replace the word willing, willing to have a passionate desire, which is a bit different than willing, isn't it, to release the fear. You see, a person whose desire in truth knows that the, that the enemy of truth, if you like, is the fear, right? The fear prevents the truth from entering. So the fear is going to be the thing that needs to be released. So I'm going to need to know what it is how it got there, and I need to feel it. And I would be willing to go through that process. Not only willing, I would be passionately desiring to go through that process because I love truth, not for any other reason. Even if I don't believe my life's going to get better doing it, I would do it for the sake of loving truth. Even if I have no faith in God, I would do it because I love truth. Even if I had no faith that my life would get better or improved by doing it, I would still do it because I love truth. That's what a person who loves truth does. They're motivated by the love of truth. Right? And they don't let their fear dictate their life. They let truth dictate their life. Truth determines everything in their life, even though they have fear. They still have fear, right? There's still fear inside of them, but they don't live by their fear. They don't let their fear dictate to them what, the fear, what, you should, what, what, you, what they should do with their life. The truth dictates every time. Right? That's a really nice place to be. It's also a very uncomplicated place to be, to be honest. Many of you do not realise how much complication you create in your life when you live your life surrounding, surrounded by fear. When you're in a truthful place, it just uncomplicates all of your life. Every single interaction, you don't even have to remember what you said last time because you know last time you were truthful. <laughs> and this time you will be too. You don't have to remember what you said to that person or this person or that person or this person. So a lot of the things that happen to you pass through you. You don't store all of the past baggage of every interaction you had with individuals. Right? Because you don't have to worry about all that because you know you're truthful and all you're going to do this time is be truthful too. And you will love the fact that they're truthful with you. You'll be drawn to people who are truthful with you. You'll enjoy their company. And people who are not truthful with you who want to maintain the facade, which is not truthful, you'll be feeling like, well, I don't really feel that attracted to those people anymore. Right? You won't even be feeling attracted anymore to creating a facade in your own life because to do such a thing is untruthful. Right? So you wouldn't feel attracted to that anymore either. Anything else you can think of? If you... <coughs> hey, Louisa. I might, I might have already said it, it might come under the love truth, but like a real desire for truth. Is that different? 
Let's, let's sort of see how... Um, I, I agree, the desire for truth is incredibly important, right? You would desire it. You wouldn't, you wouldn't be resisting it. So, so you would desire it. You desire it. Right? And of course, if you love the truth, you would probably desire it, wouldn't you? But if we look at uh, how fine this might be in terms of our inner self, so we're talking about what's inside of you here, because it's all, all of your emotions are yours, right? They, they don't belong to anybody else's, they're yours. Or, you know, to be more accurate, some of those emotions pass through the other half of yourself. So, so they're your soul's emotions, of which you are one half, but they are your emotions. No other person other than your soulmate will ever have these emotions pass through them unless they allow it to happen from an external perspective. These are, so I want to focus more on your inner world. What, what goes on in your inner world? So what are the kinds of things that happen in your inner world? All right. If we look at what happens, thanks, Matt. Um, well, I guess you wouldn't want to be pursuing denial anymore. Okay, let, well, like, how would you define your inner world? Like, in terms of what, what are the things that are involved in your inner world? Maybe, if I, maybe that's a bit of a loose question. Uh, to give you an example, your thoughts are a part of your inner world. What other things are a part of your inner world? So your thoughts are, so I'll just write down that, thoughts. What else are a part of your inner world? Intentions. Your intentions, yes. What, what are intentions? If you had to define an intention, what it really is it? Isn't it a thing that you emotionally want to do that's in your future? That's an intention, isn't it? Mm. Right, yep. So intentions, yeah. What else do you have? Thanks. Catherine? All your feelings. You have feelings or emotions, obviously, so we write down your feelings. And you have your emotions, which are really part of your feelings. But feelings would also include things like your sensory feelings, the pain that you have in your physical body, even. Does that make sense? That's a part of your sensory feelings. That's a part of what's going on in your inner world. Nobody else really knows half of your pains, physically even, until you start to tell them about them. Other than that, they are inside your inner world, are they not? Right? So, so these are part and parcel of what's inside of you. Yeah, Catherine? Would you also say it's what is in your soul? Well, all of these come from the soul. That is very true. So everything in here... Everything, including the thoughts, by the way, all are triggered by and come from your soul. So these are all soul-based things. And, of course, this is all about growing your soul. So, so, of course, we need to allow all of these things. Mel? Um, if you're true through, you'd be living in your desires and passions and then be open to what the feedback is. Good. So we would have desires would have passions and we would be honest about them and desire to live in them and desire to know whether they are in harmony or out of harmony with love, wouldn't we? Yep. Good I? What else goes on inside of us? Um, I don't know if this comes under thoughts, but it's like when you think you don't like something, you feel you don't like something, but deep, deep down you know that you do, like a secret? Like yeah, a okay. So hidden... that's, I'd classify them as thoughts, but should we call them secrets? <laughs> We'd want to know all of them as well, wouldn't we? Yeah. Okay. Kenny? What about suppression of stuff? Well, that suppresses, when we suppress, we're trying to suppress all of those. So what I'm suggesting is if we were living in harmony with truth and we were allowing our emotional self and knowing it, we wouldn't do this anymore. We wouldn't actively try to control these things anymore. Right? So, Eloisa? Uh, memories. Okay, so memories. We'd want to know our memories. Why do most people get... A why do a lot of people get Alzheimer's when they're old? They don't Why do they have dementia when they're old? They don't want to remember certain things. That's going to damage you, not wanting to remember certain things. 
right? You want to be able to remember everything. Right? It doesn't matter how much you judge it as good or bad or painful, not painful. If you were humble, you would feel the pain anyway. So, so if you're humble, you'd feel the pain, so you would want the memory. And you'd want to be truthful about the memory. Was that the actual thing that happened or not? You'd be truthful about that as well. Good. Fab? Your, your actions? like Okay. So you'd be analysing or looking at your actions and finding out what the underlying reason for them was. Yeah, and how you treated other people. How you treated... Yourself. What's the truth about how you treated somebody? What's the truth about how they treated you? You wouldn't be denying the truth about the treatment of other people or their treatment of you. Yeah? yeah. I think like God, you'd be very focused on causes... Okay, so rather than a, a so you'd want to find the truth of the causes of these yeah. things inside of you, wouldn't yeah. you? Yep, yep. Yeah. Now, many of us in the course of a day, and now we could list many more things. These are all, if you're starting to see the picture, these are all qualities of your soul that you can choose to develop, right? And to, to develop them, you're going to firstly need to be truthful about what they are, to be truthful about what is inside of you, before you begin. Now, if we're honest with ourselves, a lot of our thoughts are negative. A lot of our thoughts are completely out of harmony with love. A lot of our thoughts drive ourselves and others insane if we express them. And many of us like expressing negative thoughts because we get certain addictions met. We get to avoid certain pains within us by having other people agree with us. Right? We wouldn't do that anymore. If we were really truthful, we'd go, hang on a sec, what am I doing here? So, like, so I'm having an interaction with Matt and I'm going, what am I doing to Matt here? I'm talking about my pain. Why am I talking about my pain with Matt rather than feeling my pain? And, and therefore Matt doesn't have to put up with my pain <laughs> being expressed to him. Why would, I, why would I not choose to feel my own pain rather than expressing it all to Matt unless Matt has asked for his own sake? Why would I do it? Well, I wouldn't. If I really loved Matt and I was honest about what I was doing to him, I wouldn't do it. And this is the thing, is that we need to become very honest and truthful from an emotional perspective about what's really going on. We would want to know what's really going on about those things, wouldn't we? Yeah, Mary? We'd also want to know that about everyone else. Wouldn't we? We'd want to know about the, the truth about those things within us primarily. Correct. But then we would also seek and love to know the truth about that Other inside people. of everyone else. Exactly. Because without that, we know we're not getting the real person. Without the person being able to be this in front of us and with us, we're not getting the real person. Can you see that? So what we would choose to do? We would choose to not only do this with ourselves, but we would also choose to do it with everyone else around us and encourage everyone around us to do it with us. That's what we would do. Right? And then when somebody is truthful with us and we didn't like it, we felt bad about it, we wouldn't shut them down because that would be shutting down their soul. We wouldn't do that either. We'd just listen. We'd feel our own feelings and our own pain about that. That's what we would do. That makes sense? Okay, well, that's quite a lot to put on our list of what we would be doing if we're emotionally truth, if we if we're emotion with uh, we're emotional with regard to truth. It's quite a lot, isn't it, Matt? Would we be asking God a lot about these things, like how God sees them as well? Of course, because if we and this, I suppose you could say there's two aspects to everything I'm talking about now. One is if you do this by yourself, and the other one is if you do it with God. Now, if you do it with God, it's going to be a lot easier. But if you do it with God, you'd want to know God's opinion about these things, wouldn't you? So I would be really honest about what is God's opinion. So, so when you're in a rage with your partner, what's God's opinion about that? Do you think God goes, yeah, beauty, get on there, yeah, this is fantastic? Or do you think God's going, oh, man, I think you just need to calm down a bit there and, and need to work through the reason why you're so angry? Which one do you think God would be? You don't even, if you don't even know God yet, which one do you think God would be? Number two, right? So, so, you, so you, would, you would shoot, you'd go, okay, I'm raging in anger with my, with my partner. And it's 
pretty obvious to me that probably that's not God's truth about this situation. <laughs> right? And that would cause you to pause, would it not? In your actions and even in your thoughts, and then start directing your thoughts to his, okay, why am I so angry? What, what, what addiction inside of me didn't she meet that I wanted met in this interaction? That's what you'd be more focused on then, wouldn't you? Now, most of us are not honest with ourselves about God's opinions. We believe we don't know God's opinions, but the reality is God's opinions are pretty logical most of the time. Right? Do you think God wants to have a sleazy, you to have a sleazy, addiction-based relationship with everyone around you? Uh, do you think God's going to have one of those kind of relationships with you? Okay, that's pretty straight, isn't it? So whenever you are trying to have a sleazy, uh, addiction-based relationship with another person and you're unhappy that you didn't get your addiction met, are you in or out of harmony with God's truth on the matter? Obviously out of harmony with God's truth. Be honest about it. Okay, no matter how angry I am about this particular this feeling, the reality is I'm out of harmony with God's truth on the matter. At least tell yourself that. Because if you, if you don't tell yourself that, you're never going to actually want to find out what the emotional reason why is inside of yourself, are you? So it's, I feel involving God in the process is very, very simple actually, when it comes to truth and humility and all these things, because you can feel quite easily what God would want, even if you don't know God. If you just assume God is good, all you have to do is make two assumptions about God, that God is good and God is all-powerful. And, and you make those two assumptions about God, and then you ask yourself, would God want me to do this? <laughs> you come up with the answer pretty rapidly, and then you can check yourself against that. You can go, well, I want to do it. <laughs> But I, I'm pretty sure God probably wouldn't want me to do it. So, so why do I want to do it? I'd be more focused on finding out why I want to do it. What, what are my thoughts, my feelings about doing it? What do I get out of it? What addictions does it drive? All those things I'd be wanting to find out the truth about. And I would probably do all of this automatically, actually, once I really had a desire, wouldn't I? It would just be automatic bang, bang, bang process with almost every situation that happened. I'm angry, I'm out of harmony with God's truth, therefore am I out of line? I'm out of line with God's love, obvious. What do I need to do to find out the truth? What am I going to do? What, what, what's the problem here? These kind of things are what you would do if you really understood your emotional self and you really wanted to grow emotionally. You would automatically be focusing on those things with regard to truth. Can you see that? And again, we haven't done an exhaustive list, but we've had many, many many discussions about truth and if you go back over those discussions you'll find that there's and there's, we've had many discussions about divine truth the qualities of God's truth and all of those kind of things we've had a lot of discussion about truth generally per facing personal truth and all these kind of discussions I'm sure you would find out what you would do if you were emotional about it by having a look at all those discussions again right okay well, let's look at the next one So the next one is, if I really, um, if I loved, what would I do? If I was focusing on my emotional side of myself, what would I do? And I'm going to ask a question of, about love, what would I do in four main areas? If I loved God, what would I do? If I wanted God's love, what would I do? If I loved other people, what would I do? And if I wanted other people's love, what would I do? Those four things. Okay, so let's first ask the first one. If I loved God, if I loved God, what would I do? If I was focused on developing emotionally. Laura? I would respect his laws. How can you respect laws you don't even know? Oh well, I'd come to. I'd want. I'd have a desire to know, to to know how God's laws are in operation in order. His loving laws. So are how in do you operation. know? Them? How do you know? Um, well, first, if I desire them, I'd want to be in harmony with the way God feels about me and others and the environment. But how do you know? I'd have to emo emotion. You'd I'd, have to. Well, I'd have to experiment with the laws in order. Okay, to okay. You'd have to experiment with them, and. Discover information about them, wouldn't you? 
just for, so it can be a personal experience and not yes. something I've read. Okay, so, so if you loved God, if you desired, decided you wanted to love God, one of the first things you'd be trying to do is to discover God, discover God's nature, God's personality, God's character, God's all of these things about God. How do you do that? You do that by studying the concept of God from an emotional perspective. Does that make sense to everyone? Now, many of us never done that, right? I know but Paul's done it. I can feel Paul's done that. Very few people in this auditorium at the moment have done it. I know Paul has because I know I can feel his love for God. I can feel his desire to know God. It's very strong in him, right? But most of us sort of leave God on the back burner if you think about it. We do, don't we? If we're honest with ourselves, we don't think about loving God. We think about God loving us. <laughs> but that's a bit selfish, isn't it? Like... How do you develop a relationship where it's all one-sided, where they have to love you, but you don't have to do anything? Does that kind of relationship really work? Right. So if you imagine you, imagine you, you married and the, the, the things you said at the, it, during your marriage were, I would like you to love me, but I don't have to love you. <laughs> now, would, that come out, would that come across pretty romantic in the... In the process of your wedding ceremony you know like I don't have to love you but you've got to love me and that's all I'm interested in so what's that called there's a word for that narcissism narcissism selfishness <laughs> yeah so so if we really wanted to have a relationship with God wouldn't we want to discover God okay so so if I loved God the f one of the first things I'd want to do is discover God's nature isn't it you can't love someone you haven't, you don't know, right? And as Laurie pointed out, the way you do that is by experimenting with your relationship with God. That's what, how, how you do that. If you think about how you do it with a person, how do you do it? You experiment with a relationship with them, don't you? To, when you first see a person, you go, I would really like to get to know that person. What do you do? You take action and spend time with that person. You try to get to know that person. You try to listen to that person about how they have lived their life, their history and all these other things. This is the thing you try to do, isn't it? So why don't you do that with God? Why don't you try, at least attempt, to do that with God? Now, a lot of people then say, well, but, you know, God's not the same as a relationship with a person. And I say, no, God's is an easier relationship than a relationship with a person. God is totally willing and desirous of sharing all that information with you about herself. And the only thing stopping you from absorbing that information about her is you, your unwillingness to know her, your unwillingness to discover She's totally open to letting you everything, know everything, everything possible about her nature, her character, her laws, her abilities, her power, all these things that we often talk about but we don't know much about because we haven't done anything about trying to discover God's nature for ourselves personally. Right? If I was understanding my emotional self and I loved God, I would be desiring this with my feelings. I'd be going, wow, you know, this is something that I need to focus a bit of my time on. Like, Jesus is saying to me that the most important relationship that I'm ever going to develop is my relationship with God. And yet, how many times do I ask about my physical relationships and nothing about my relationship with God? If we're honest with ourselves, almost every single question that we ask is generally not about God. But that's the primary relationship. Once we have that as the primary relationship, every single question probably will firstly be about God. And then about our relationships with people and our partner and our children and all those other things. Does that make sense? Can you see how how even our day-to-day -day life is illustrating that we don't really yet have a strong desire to, to love God, to actually know God, to feel God. Because most of the time, the questions we're asking ourselves are not about God at all. They're about everything else other than God. 
we, uh, we of course, have a, the Frequently Asked Questions channel now, right? We get lots and lots of e emails in about, you know, questions about all sorts of things. Emotions, we got something like 200 or so questions. Um, we've actually filtered out a lot of doubling up and all those kind of things. And in the end, we've got a couple of hundred more questions that we want to answer about emotions. If I, I went through recently all of the lists of things that, we, that people have asked about. And you know there's only 13 questions about God. Now, this is from a group of people who say that they want to place God as their first relationship. And there's only 13 questions about God. We have over 2,500 questions and 13 of them about God. And you know what that says to me? We don't really want to know about God. We want God to know about us. And trust me, God already does. That's the sad thing. God already knows about you. It's you who don't know about God yet. That's, you know, that's the problem. That's the reason why we're closed to this and closed to that and closed to the reception of love. A lot of times it's because we don't really truly have a desire to know the person who is actually giving us the love. Yeah. Eric? So I could add to your list of what I would do if I loved God. Sure. I would be willing to open my heart to God. Yes. To expose who I am to God without trying to censor that and overcome any fear I have of, of doing that because yeah. I wanted to give my feelings to God. So let's be more specific about it. It's really opening my heart. So let's, it's opening my heart in two ways. One way is to give my feelings. And what's the other way? To receive God's feelings. To receive God's feelings. And I do that when I love. Like, when I love, I open my heart to give and receive simultaneously. That's an expression of love. Exactly. It's not, oh, I want to give love or receive love as two separate things. When love is in my heart, it opens my heart towards that person or towards God. And then Correct. I want to give and receive simultaneously. Correct. Now... God is not injured in love. Uh, you've heard me say this many, many times. God's not injured in love. The average person on the planet is injured in love. So, so what is more complicated, trying to resolve your, your, your relationship with people on earth or trying to resolve your relationship with God? Well, of course, it's the people on earth that are more complicated, isn't it? Because we've got our own injuries and their injuries to work our way through. With God, we've only got our own injuries to work our way through. And so it's less complicated to have a relationship with God than it is to have a relationship with any other being. So it makes sense to start with your relationship with God, not for it to be the one that you ask about at the end or at last, but rather to be the one you focus on first. Right? Can you see that? Yeah, Matt? It's probably a bit of an open-ended question, but why is it that we all on earth just want to live in denial almost of God's existence? Um, well, because we've got so many emotions about it. We've got so many emotions locked up about God's existence. So many fears, so many denials, so, many, so much untruth is perpetrated, both in the name of God erroneously, but also so much untruth in terms of what is God's nature, what is God's character, all of those things. We hardly know anything. Most people don't want to know God because they feel that it's impossible to know God. And when you feel something's impossible, you don't bother trying. You just don't. So the majority of people on this planet have no faith that God exists, and no faith that even if God does exist, that they personally can ever know God. And so they don't bother trying. If you think about the last six years or so, for many of you, that you've been associated with divine truth, and you reflect back that you've very rarely asked questions about God and God's nature, right? 
Like I've received hardly any questions from you about God or God's nature. And then you think about why that's the case. What would you feel is the case? What do you feel is the reason why that's the case? Laura? I think it ties into what we spoke about yesterday with um, not forgiving our parents or still feeling we need to repent for our parents. So it's linked with the feelings that we have with our parents. We put that on, people put that on God and still view that, yes. that relationship as the same. Yes. So shall we say in a summary of that, shall we say we're imposing our relationship with our parents upon God. We're basically believing God is the same as our parents. So and that we, is a problem, isn't and it? And if we have fear of our parents and don't and, and feel unsafe, um, which we all did feel unsafe, then we feel unsafe to open our heart to, to God for the same fears. Good. So that's that's one of our main problems. How how honest are we about our relationship with our parents generally? Most people are not very honest at all, you know. And if you can't be honest about your relationship with your parents, how are you ever going to break down the blockage between you and God if one of the major blockages is your relationship with your parents? It's not going to be possible. So that is a problem. Yep. Can you see that understanding your emotional self requires that you start to feel about, OK, I haven't really been very emotional with God. I haven't really wanted this relationship with God. I haven't really desired it. I haven't really longed for it. So how can I really expect to enter and know everything God knows? I can't. None of that's possible unless I really desire this relationship with God. And yet when it comes to my relationship with my partner, how much words, energy, time, emotion gets expended there? trying to get to know them in comparison. Huge amounts, huge amounts. Right? And how many questions have I asked about all sorts of things? My own emotional condition, my own emotional state, my, you know, my own you know, th th truths about external truths about the universe. Long lists of them. I've had many conversations with many of you where I've answered 50 questions in a row about those kind of things. Right? And yet not one question about God. And to me, that tells us something. That tells me something, anyway. It tells me that most of us are still pretty blocked towards God. Now, if you're fairly blocked towards God, how are you going to be open to receiving God's love? It's going to be hard. And this is why many of us are finding it hard. Because we're not open to that relationship for whatever reasons. Like, it would be wise, you would think, wouldn't it, it would be wise to focus on why you're not open to that relationship as one of the first things you address. That, that would be where wisdom would dictate where you would spend your time. Focus first on the th reason why you haven't got a relationship with God. That will help you sort out a lot of other problems in the process. Right? Okay. So if you love God... How would it be now on the other side of this if you allowed God to love you? So, what would that look like emotionally? Igor? You would allow the intensity of God's emotion to overwhelm you. You would. You would start letting God's emotions into you, wouldn't you? You would start letting God tell you what God feels about you. Right? Many of you are not doing that because what, you know what you do instead? You say, it's impossible for God to feel that about me. You've already got a heap of judgments about God and, you say, and you're telling yourself constantly that you're not, you're not going to be able to feel what God feels about you. Yes, you are. The only thing limiting you from feeling what God feels about you is your inability to be humble. <laughs> In other words, your inability to just feel some things emotionally. Right? That's the only thing limiting it. God wants to share her emotions with you. And in particular, God wants to share what God feels about you with you. Right? 
But we're so focused on going, no, what my parents think about me is right, what my facade says about me is right, what my injured self is is right, and we don't find out anything in those places because, about ourselves, really, because God is not allowed to share with us in those places while we're shutting down our emotion. For God to tell us the truth, we're going to have to be open to what the truth is about us. All right, here you go. Correct me if I'm wrong, but it's a, it's a sweet feeling, isn't it? From, of course it's, it's a sweet feeling, but, but it's also very emotional. It's also very emotional. And this is where many of us have a problem with understanding our emotional self. We're trying to shut down our emotions while at the same time feel how God feels about us. But everything that God feels about you is emotional. Everything. Right? So while you're trying to shut down the emotion, while at the same time feel God, it's not going to work. Of course it's not going to work. That's why most of us don't feel it. That's why most of us don't feel what God feels about us. And you know what we do instead then when we're not feeling what God feels about us? Because we're not feeling what God feels about us and we want to feel good, we start looking to our addictions to feel good. If you could feel how God feels about you most of the time, do you think you'd be searching for addictions to, with other people to make yourself feel good? Of course you wouldn't. So even our desire to have our addictions met is driven by the fact that we're denying the relationship with God and wanting our addictions met because, because they are the only things that make us feel good. But the person who can really make us feel good is God telling us the truth about ourselves. But you know what most of us feel about God telling us the truth about ourselves? What do you feel about God telling you the truth about yourself? Most of you feel that anything God feels about me is always going to be, it's going to be bad. God's going to warts and all with me, and it's only going to be warts in the end, <laughs> is the way we generally feel, right? We only see what we, we believe that God sees us the way we see ourselves or the way our parents saw us or the way our environment saw us. And none of those things are true, but that's what we believe. And so we are not open to allowing God to, to give us the feeling about ourselves that we're desperately in need of feeling and so what we do is we develop holy predictions to get them all met somewhere else. Instead, it would make more logical sense, wouldn't it, to start allowing ourselves to feel or attempt to feel what God feels about us. Now, I've been experimenting with this a lot in the last year or so, and it's really hard sometimes. It is really hard. Because inside of yourself, you have so many beliefs that are false about yourself, that every time you try to open up to one of God feeling, God's feelings about you, you'll find that there's a whole heap of layers of feelings that you've got to wade your way through first before you'll let yourself feel what God feels. Right? So it's a great way to progress. Because you can feel this first and feel that and feel this and this belief that you have and that belief that you have all start coming up and you realise, wow, I'm really closed to letting God tell me what God feels about me. And God tells you through the emotional experience. So in other words, I'm really closed to letting God feel for me what God feels for me and me receiving that feeling. I'm close to receiving the feeling. So if I allowed God to love me, I would receive... I'll just use the green. God's feelings about me. Now, as you can see, the majority of us are not doing that. And I'd put myself there in a fair portion of the time. The reality is we are so blocked to receiving God's feelings about us that we block that flow that's possible most of the time. Right? Now when you've got very low feelings of worth, very low feelings of who you are, you've been shamed and guilted most of your life, of course you're going to have low feelings about yourself. And it's only your 
your resistance to feeling that pain that stops you from feeling how God feels about you. Yeah, Mary? I don't know if it's like that for other people, but I find I don't have the belief that God feels the same way about me as other people. Yeah. But because I don't want to feel the contrast between how I feel about myself or how others have treated me and the way God feels about me. So yeah. my resistance to the, the love is about my resistance to the grief that would be triggered. Well, it's to resistance to pain, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, so it's not always our belief that God is exactly like our parents. Sometimes it's the feeling that we just really don't want to feel the truth about true, our parents. True, true. Yeah. A lot of times the contrast between God's feelings and your environment's feelings about you are so great that it would automatically trigger your grief that you don't wish to feel, the pain you don't wish to feel. And so you, instead of allowing yourself to feel God's feelings about you, what do you do? You shut down God's feelings about you, and in the process of shutting down God's feelings about you, you are able to manage the pain of how other people felt about you. Of course, that doesn't work very well because at the end you don't get to receive any of God's love then. And remember that God's love is the transformative substance that operates upon your soul. So while you're doing this, very little soul-based transformation can actually occur from God's perspective. And then all of the soul-based transformation has to be on your own effort. In other words, you're on the natural love path, progressing, making soul trying to make soul-based transformation on the natural love path when you're doing that. Right? Every time you refuse the reception of God's love, you are automatically on the natural love path. Right? That's the reality. And most of us are on the natural love path most of the time. And there are occasions in our life where we engage this process with God and therefore we're on the path or the way, if you like, the way to having this relationship with God. I would also allow myself to receive God's truth about me, wouldn't I? Can you see that? I would allow God's truth to enter me. So when I've done something that's out of harmony with love, the more sensitive I became to God or in receiving God's love, the more I'd know it's out of harmony with love. So I'd automatically start knowing things that are out of harmony with love more than I did before. I would know when they're not right. I would know. I wouldn't have to ask questions anymore of other people. I, was, you know, I wouldn't have to go up to Jesus and say, um, is this right or is this not? Because you would know, because God's already told you, right? because you're open to receiving it from God. To, to be open to receiving it from God requires you to be the most humble, because all of God's transmission of truth comes through your emotional condition. Right? When you come up to somebody else and ask them the question, you don't have to be very humble, because they can just tell you, and you don't have to be open to the emotion coming from them. You don't have to be open to it emotionally. You're just hearing the words, right? When you've got a re developing relationship with God, you, God is teaching you how to be humble, to be sensitive to God's emotions. And all of God's emotions are the most powerful, but also the most clear. So, so this is the reason why we don't understand truth a lot. We don't understand truth because we're not allowing emotional sensitivity to God's emotions. We're not allowing ourselves to be humble in our relationship with God. That's why we don't know what the truth is. If we were allowing ourselves to be humble in our relationship with God, God would tell us the truth every single moment. Then we'd know what God's truth is. And of course then we wouldn't have to ask anybody what it is. Right? Now that doesn't mean that there might not be people who come along into your life that will help you. It just means that your primary focus is your relationship with God not your relationship with other people. So if you truly loved God and wanted love from God, these are just some of the things you'd be doing. Now, we can create a very long list here of all the things you could be doing from an emotional perspective that would help you open more to God. But you can see that it's a large part of understanding your emotional self. If you can feel the truth from God about you, 
then you'll find out about you far faster than you'll find out about you from any other source, including yourself. Any other source, including yourself. Because God knows everything about you. God created your soul. God created its potentials. God created the other half of your soul. God created everything that you, the universe in which this soul plays. God created all of the potential things that you could experience. God knows where you can go. God knows your future. God knows your past. God knows everything about you. Most of you have hardly any knowledge about your childhood. And the reason why is because most of you are in complete denial of the emotions about your childhood, but also because we're completely blocked to somebody, God, telling us about what our childhood was really like. We're, if we let God tell us what our childhood is really like, we'll go through a lot of emotions, but also we'll get to trust God a lot more. We'll go, wow, that was true, that was true, that was true, yeah, I remember that now. And you start to trust the person of God rather than just thinking that God's some far-off being who has no personal interest in your life. God created a whole universe where God knows everything about every one of God's creations, every single one. What you ignore happening in the universe, and when I say ignore, like most of you tread on 100, 200, 500 ants a day, right? You ignore it. God knows every time that happened. God knows the transference of any energy that has occurred at any level, at any time, and in any minuscule degree. Right? These are a part of the things that are God's. So God knows everything about you. So what's the most rapid way for you to find out about you? Be open to, for God to tell you about you. That's the fastest way. It's far better than asking Jesus about you. Jesus asked God about himself, so why wouldn't you do the same? Here you go. Just the receiving feelings from God about you. Uh, God, do we receive just the pure, how he made us, feeling, or the, in, or no, the injured, injured? Injured and everything, yeah. God will show you. If you're open, God will show you everything about you, including all of your injuries, where they came from, what triggered them, what caused them, what in your side of your parents made them occur, everything. As, as a feeling. As feelings, yes, yeah, always as feelings. Because none of God's communication with you is intellectual. It's soul-to-soul -soul communication. It's direct soul-to-direct-soul -direct -soul communication. This is why it's so important for you to understand your emotional self. Without understanding your emotional self, you will never be able to receive God's feelings. You need to be open to that. Receiving God's love also sensitizes you to love. And so then you become even more sensitive to the areas where you're out of harmony with love. So God gives you the truth about your condition, but also having received the love, you suddenly become more sensitive to everything else with regards to love in your life. Yeah. Yep. So, so we, we've we lived a life of desensitization. And when you start like, allowing yourself to be open to God's love for you, you start resensitizing your soul. And after a while, you become so sensitive. Like God's soul is very, very sensitive. Like I said, God feels every single thing, every single thing that happens in God's universe, God feels. All right? That's how sensitive God's soul is. The most sensitive being in the, and, I, and in the universe is not the right statement, it's probably. The most sensitive being, universal being is God. Because God exists outside of the universe because God's created, but God's sensitive to everything that's happening in them. Right? And eventually you'll become just as sensitive. You'll become just as sensitive. You, you'll not only just be sensitive to your own feelings, you'll be sensitive to your partner's feelings, your friend's feelings, your children's feelings, your, your animals around you's feelings, the creatures around you's feelings, the, the nature around you and how that feels when we, when we do, do things to it. You'll be sensitive to the spirit, feelings of spirits, the feelings of whatever dark spirits or bright spirits. It doesn't matter. You'll be sensitive to all their feelings. And you won't feel overwhelmed by it because your soul has expanded enough 
to process all of that emotion, all of that emotion and feeling, without you becoming overwhelmed. Isn't God's love an amazing thing? It allows that soul to do that. Okay. Well, the next thing I'd like to do, just in this session, is to to focus on the other half of the issue, and that is, if I if I loved, I'll uh, just, just green again. If I loved others, what would that look like emotionally? Any ideas what that might look like emotionally if you loved others? Kenny? There's a mic coming over there. <coughs> you would be more open to how they feel and how they feel about you. Yes. You, you were, so you you'd feel. be open, you'd desire, yeah. in fact, their feelings for you. Mm. Uh, sorry, desire, in here we're talking about loved others, so we were talking about desire to feel for them. All right, wouldn't we? We'd do that, okay. And respect how they feel, their love. Okay, their yes, you would honour their feelings. And that, but that wouldn't be their facade feelings that you're honouring a feeling, would it? It would be their true feelings. That's what you would honour. So, so, for example, if you tell me that you're really, really happy today and I know you're really, really sad today, I would honour that you're really, really sad today, not what you've told me. <laughs> yep. Does that make sense? Yep. Teresa? I'm not, I'm not sure about this one, but I think it's if I loved others, I'd be willing to share myself with them. Uh, you would, yes. You would share yourself with them, yeah. Does that mean that you would share yourself in your addiction? In other words, no, your true you share yourself because it gives you a whole heap of things back. No, no, no you wouldn't do that, your, would you? Your true self and your true feelings. So your true self, yep, with them. So you wouldn't cover over yourself, put on a facade with them. You wouldn't try to make them feel something they don't feel or that you don't feel. You would not do any of those things, would you, if you really loved them? Emotionally, you couldn't do it. You, you would just go, no, I can't do that. I've just got to be my real self with them and I've got to honour who they really are. So if they're a murderer who wants to you know, rape and pillage the everything in the world, you'd honour you'd honor that in the sense that you'd acknowledge that's the kind of person they are at the moment. You wouldn't try to falsify to yourself what they're really like. Can you see that? I see a lot of you doing that, particularly with your families. You try to make out that your family is good when actually there's a lot of dark emotions going on in the family. If you really loved them, you wouldn't, you wouldn't put up with the facade, you'd go, no, there's a lot of dark emotions going on <laughs> here in this family. That's what you would do. That's what you do when you love people. You love them. You don't feed their addictions anymore. Yeah? Fab? I desire to know them too. Like to not just feel them, but to really know who yeah. they are. Very, very important. How do you know someone? Know their soul or just to... Um you ask about them, you, you mm. get to know them maybe. Yeah, I, like if I asked you about you, I'd get a whole heap of things that are completely false. <laughs> What's a more sure way of knowing you? I'm going to pass it down to Sue. Feel them. You need to be open feeling. to feeling them. Yeah. Like, so on one hand, you're feeling for them. In other words, you're feeling compassion, kindness, feelings of emotions that are in you for them. And then on the other hand, if you really desire to love other people, you would want to, to know them by feeling what they feel really inside of them. Be open to feeling what they really feel. Not what they say they're feeling, 
but what's really going on, what's really there. Now, the only way you're going to do that is for you to understand your own emotional self so you can tell the difference between your feelings and their feelings and you can actually feel their feelings no matter what they are, even if they've... So if, even if they're feelings you've never felt, you'd be able to feel what they're feeling because you'd be open to it as long as you are open to your own feelings. So this would require you also being open to your own feelings, of course. I just feel that, that you are and Mary are the perfect example of that. I'm not the perfect example of that, actually. <laughs> the perfect yeah. example of, of all of these things is God with you. Yeah. Like, the reality... Well, you demonstrate to us... In well, I good. demonstrate a little tiny bit of what is pot our potential... But the reality is God is doing this with each individual. God, God already does it. This is the beauty of developing your relationship with God first because God is the being who is already doing this perfectly with you. Yeah. So when you desire to know a person, you desire to know what they are really, not what they present as their facade, not what they would like you to believe they are, but really what they are. And, that, and when you're open to that, and when you become at one with God, you'll find yourself open to that completely. And what will happen is you'll be able to feel everyone around you and know what is really in them, good and bad. Good, when I say good, emotions that are harmonious with love. And when I say bad, emotions that are completely out of harmony with love. You'll be able to feel both. You'll be able to feel what motivates them, their desires, their passions, their longings. Even if their longings are out of harmony with love, you'll be able to know what they are. And if their emotions are in harmony with love, you know what they are. You'll know what their deep desires are, what kind of nature and personality they have inside of their soul. When you can feel all of those things, you can feel those kind of things from them. So that's what you would want to do. If you really loved them and you were doing this in an emotional way, that's what you would do. You think how many relationships you even have doing that. The average person doesn't even have that kind of relationship with their partner, let alone anyone else. Right? They definitely don't have that relationship with their children because most of the time they're trying to impose their, their own emotions on their children. right? And they definitely don't have this idea of, what's my child feel? What's my child's real desire? What's my child's use of its will? How does it want to use its will? They, most people don't even know because they're not willing to feel their child, they just want their child to feel them. They impose their own feelings on their child. They don't want to feel the child's feelings. All right. yeah. um, would their relationship with themselves and their relationship with God be important to you? Of course. You would want, you would want to do whatever you can to help them grow individually and also, if they desired, grow their relationship with God. But you would only want to help them if they desired it. right? Because what, what would also be a feeling inside of you is, I honour your will to decide that you don't want to. That would also be present. So when someone doesn't want to do something, you wouldn't be angry and upset with them. You'd say, fair enough, you don't want to do that. Okay, let's be honest about that. And you could also then decide, well, I don't want to be around with you while you don't want to do that. <laughs> You're allowed to do that too. But you would at least honour the fact that each person has their own will and has the, the ability and also should be given the chance to exercise it. That's what God does. And that's how you will love your, your brother. You will love them the same way. If you really love others, that's what you'll do. You'll honour their will. You won't try to control, circumvent their will. You'll try to work with their will, just like God's trying to work with your will to become more loving. You would also try to work with their will to become more loving. So if you find there's an area of their life where they do want to become more loving, and it's got nothing to do with God, nothing to do with the much of the things that you like, but there's an area of their life that they want to become more loving, you would want to help them do that because you know that if there's one area of their life where they become more loving, there's a potential that other areas might come up where they want to be more loving. So you'd want to do that. So you don't just go wipe people off, the only time that you would prevent yourself from interacting with people is when they're continually attacking you or continually attacking other people and continually degrading the condition of love of other people or yourself or attempting to. Then, of course, you'd go, no, my love for you dictates I can't do this with you. 
Because if I do that with you, I'm feeding your addictions. I'm creating a monster in you. I don't want to do that. I want to, I want to become more loving myself, and I would like to see you do it too. Of course, I respect your right to go and do that if that's what you want, but you're not going to be able to do that with me. And you'd be okay with that. You wouldn't be yelling and screaming about them about it. You'd be okay with it. But you'd also draw the line in the sand. Whenever love's compromised, you say, no, it's no good now. Because I love you. I can't let you continually compromise love without me saying something or, or, or doing something about that. Not to the person, but for your own sake. If you loved them, you wouldn't do that. So can you see what you would do? Now, if we're honest with ourselves, for the majority of us don't do these things with other people. We barely have the time to survive even in Western countries, we barely have the time to survive our day-to-day -day life before we even consider doing any of these things with anybody. That's the reality, isn't it? Yeah. Now, if I desired other people's love, what would I do? What would I do if I desired to be loved? It says. If I'd, I'm emotional. I'd treat them the way that I'd like to be treated. Hmm. Is it the way you'd like to be treated or is it the way that you know is right to be treated? The way that I know is right to be treated. That's very different to the way mm. you'd like to be treated, right? Mm. Because when we're full of error, the it's way addiction. we'd like to be treated is often in addiction. Mm. And that's not loving them or us, right? Isn't it more I would desire to love them the way God loves them? And I would desire that they love me the way God loves me. Does that make it more specific? So, And it's a very important thing what I just said, of course. I would desire to love them the way God loves loves them, and I would desire for them to love me the way God loves me. That's what I would do. Right. So that's a very important thing. Now, I don't want to write all that down because I don't have enough room on the board, but it's a very important thing to understand. I would not desire to love them the way I want to be loved because the way I want to be loved in quotation marks, is often in addiction and in codependence. And that would be completely out of harmony with the way God loves, in fact. Yep. Laura, if we go back up there with the mic. Please. Um, so when we're children and we have the desire to be loved by our parents, um, that would be the, the pure, like, not that we'd intellectually know, but it must be a pure desire to be loved the way that God would love us because we're not aware of an addictive love, we just know there's pain that we're not being loved. Now, you said that when we're born or when we're a child? When we're little, like three. Yeah, yeah. so th that's not true because by the time we're born or uh, three years of age, we've already had a lot of addictive emotions from our parents enter us. So you could say only that at the time we're conceived, we have no addiction in our desire for love. But by the time we're born, we've had nine months with our addictive parents. Now we do have some addictions in our desires to be loved. Does that make sense? Already. We're already being, we have already been damaged by that point in time. Now, of course, if our parents were completely in harmony with God's love when, when they conceived me, so when they conceived us, if our parents were completely in harmony with God's love, then we would have no addictions or codependency in our desire to be loved. See, a desire to be loved, and this is something I'd like to point out to you, a desire to be loved is completely different to a demand to be loved. And the majority of us demand to be loved. We don't desire to be loved. A desire is a completely different emotion than a demand. All right. If we go Vanessa and then across to Paul. 
Yeah, I'm really struggling with what you're saying there. Even just writing a desire to be loved, I don't feel it's a natural part of our state to, like, I just don't feel that I should desire to be loved. Why not? Because it always comes out demanding from me. Well, so. that, see that, yeah, that's where we it becomes tainted by what's happened to us during our childhood and our addictions and so forth. So it can be that we're born, yeah, that we're we're born with that demand. Yes, we can be born with that demand, mm. because by the time we've been born, we've had nine months in the womb absorbing the emotions of both our mother and our father, if our father's around, but definitely our mother, um, and we've absorbed her emotions for nine months. And whatever she feels about love is probably what we're going to end up feeling about love after that period of time. Remember, our soul's like a great big sponge soaking up all of the emotion. So a lot of what we feel about love is already going to be dependent upon what our mother and father felt about love at the time we were conceived. So yes, we can be born with addictions. As you know, you can be born with physical addictions if, you're, if, you're, if your mother smokes or drink, drinks a lot or takes drugs, you can be born with an addiction to those things physically. So why couldn't you be born with an emotional addiction? Of course you can be born with an emotional addiction because your soul is even more sensitive to the emotional addiction than the physical one. So, yes. That explains a lot. <laughs> yeah. Many of us are born with emotional addictions. Therefore, we have no concept of what love is. Yeah, none, none at all, because it's already been distorted by the time we're born. Huh? However, I must point out that it's un, unusual for it to be completely distorted. And this is why many babies, when they're born, cry a lot. Because they're feeling the grief of being unloved already. Does that make sense? They're already feeling the grief of being unloved. That's why they cry a lot. And you can't stop them, except if you put some, you know, food or, you know, mum's breast in their mouth, or you, what else do you do? Put a dummy in their mouth, or, you know, emotional projections to shut up, lock them in a room, then you can shut them, start shutting them down, which is what most of us finish up doing, unfortunately. All right? which actually push, puts the suppression on the grief, which is not very helpful to the child's soul-based development. But yes, the majority of us are born already with a lot of distortions about what love is, yep. because we absorbed them in the nine months we were in our mother's wombs. Laura. That, that's actually kind of strangely comforting for me. Right? Why is that comforting for you? Um, because I, yeah, I just, I feel in my core that I've just got this error that I've, it's like a curse, I guess. Yes, and you've blamed yourself for it. And I have, yes. Yes. And so now you're seeing that it's actually not you that's been the problem. So that's why it's comforting. Yep. So that's good. It's good that you see that truth. Because it is a truth. Yeah. Um. I was just feeling that when I do um, start longing for God's love, I go to a childhood place, but in that childhood place, I'm waiting to be loved and there is a frustration there. Yep. So that shows that's me not that a childhood place, that's an addictive place. But still the addiction was there in the childhood place. So well, you think about your parents, you, you examine your parents like we were talking about yesterday. There was a lot of feelings, particularly from your mother, of competition, trying to humiliate you, you know, trying to scare you and terrify you, taking photos of you, of you being terrified and scared and laughing about it. You know, these are all things that, that have entered you emotionally. And so, of course, you're going to come out of that feeling like you're waiting to be loved and not receiving any. Yeah, so I always thought that that was more causal because it was childhood, but I never knew that the childhood had the addictions in place. And to go really beyond that is to feel through that and enter somewhere where I'm not even aware of right now. Correct, yeah. So at the moment, your belief of God is that you're going to long for God's love oh, and... Just waiting for it again. Yeah, God's not going to give you any, just like your parents. Yeah. That's what you believe. Yeah. 
And that's why a lot of us don't even bother longing for God's love. Because we believe, before we begin, that we're not going to get any because that's exactly what happened when we were children. We longed for love then and didn't get any. And we impose a lot of our beliefs upon God, you see. Yeah. Paul, you had some... Just wondering about... Um, um, this is how it can work for me sometimes. If, I'm, if I see something loving or love in action... Mm-hmm. I feel the sadness of the lack of love yep. and then I feel like, oh, I really want to be loved. And so I'm wondering about, and, and, and so if I direct my thoughts towards God, please love me, God, yep. is that a neediness towards God because I don't want to feel the sadness? I feel you can be very, like, if you're not careful, you can be very uh, complicated with the way you deal with your relationship with God. If you fully allow your feelings associated with the fact that when you see a contrast between love and no love, it causes you to trigger tears. If you allow yourself to completely feel that grief, right, then there can be no addictive relationship with God. The other thing is that if you long for God's love and you don't receive it, then it's probably an addiction. Does that make sense? Because God will only give you love when it's not an addiction. So, so automatically, receive, if you are receiving God's love, you don't have to worry. <laughs> it's, it's, it's different than if you're in a relationship with someone on earth, right? If I'm in a relationship with Mary and I'm receiving love from Mary, I don't know whether it's because of my addiction or not. Because she may be in addiction, right? In giving it. And so I don't know whether I'm getting my addiction met or she's really loving me necessarily. But when my relationship is with God, I know God's not going to meet my addictions. So if I am receiving love from God when I'm longing for it, then it means I'm not in my addictions. Automatically. You see, and this is the beauty of having the relationship with God first, is that you get to feel what it's like to actually have all of your addictions confronted. If you're not receiving love from God when you think you have a longing, then it's obviously an addictive longing. Because otherwise you would be receiving God's love in that moment. So it's got to be something wrong with the longing. Otherwise, and therefore not pure, otherwise you would be receiving God's love. That's all you need to worry about. You don't have to worry about anything else. No, and, and perhaps there's a little bit of confusion right in that process of um, feeling this sadness and stuff, and I probably don't need to worry about it because when, if I focus on God, I think, well, this is one person who can love me. Yes. And so that's where I want to direct some energy. Yes. And so it can just keep me in the process of feeling the sadness, of the contrast of not feeling loved, I guess. Correct. But also if you're not feeling the flow of love from God, then it means most probably that your longing for God in that moment is out of harmony with sincerity or purity. Because if you were sincere and pure, you would be receiving love from God in that moment. Yeah, and what I'm thinking goes on is like, it's like God love me so I don't have to feel how bad I feel about not being loved. Yes, and God's not going to do that. That's an addiction. Yeah. 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 But you, in that moment, you'll know it's an addiction because you, you, you won't receive God's love under those circumstances. Yeah. Does that make sense? So it's really simple to tell whether, with God whether you're in or out of harmony with love. If you're receiving God's love, then you're in harmony. If you're not, you're out. It's so simple. But when you're in a relationship with someone else, it's very complicated because it could be, like in my relationship with Mary, it could be that something's wrong with Mary receiving love or Mary giving love or it might be something wrong with me receiving love or something wrong with me giving love. That would stop the love from flowing between the two of us. There's four things that could go wrong. With God, there's only two things that can go wrong. It's either I'm not open to receiving or I'm not open to giving with God. That's the two things, and that's it. And both of them involve me. So I can easily tell that there's something wrong about me when I have developed my relationship with God. But when I develop my relationship with another person, there might be four things going wrong, and two of those things are about somebody else. It makes it really complicated to determine what's really going on, particularly when I am distorted in my viewpoints of love. Right? And this is where, with regard to understanding your emotional self, the fastest way to understand your emotional self is to develop your relationship with God first. 
because it's far less complicated than any other relationship. Now, that's not the way most of us think. The most of us think is the relationship with God is most complicated because we don't know anything about it. We don't know anything about God. We don't understand. We, that's what we think. And so what we try to do is we forget about developing our relationship with God and we focus on developing our relationship with the person. But that's going to make our life very complicated because we're not going to know which time the person, the other person, in my relationship with Mary, I don't know which time, because my, my love might be distorted, right? So I don't know which time Mary's actually loving me. She might be loving me and I think she's not. Or, or she might be not loving me and I think she is. Or she might be not receiving my love and I think she is, <laughs> right? Because she's receiving an addiction Right, addictively, or something like that, or she, you know, I might be blocked to giving it or receiving it myself. So there's all sorts of things that could be going on that confuse, very confusing. But with my relationship with God, it's not that confusing. If you're receiving God's love, then you're in harmony with love. <laughs> if you're not receiving God's love, then you're out of harmony with love. <laughs> it's really simple. Like there's something inside of me that's wrong every single time, and. And see, most of us go into that place and we go, there's something inside of me that's wrong. And then we go into the punishing side. Oh, there's something wrong with me again. Why is there always something wrong with me? You know, we, we start to punish ourselves about all that. But we don't need to because most of what's wrong with you, if we look at what's wrong with you, it only came from two possible sources. One was the way you were treated, as we talked about yesterday, the people we need to forgive. And... The other is the way you treated others, which are the people you need to repent towards. That's the only two ways something can be wrong, right? And, 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 and so if something's going on with God, I know. Something's going on with God and I'm not receiving God's love. It's got to be something wrong with those two things. Yeah? Far away? Um, 